Just to let you know, we are streaming right now, so any conversation you may have may be broadcast. No, because the mic picks me up, but not you. Yeah. And I've tried a different mic, and it's always, yeah. I didn't know if you were that. People that were sitting in the table, I think, were gathered. Yeah. Anybody that would be. Just so you know. I'm not going to read tonight for that reason. And because of that, I'm not reading tonight. And because of, I can't be heard. I'm not reading. And I have an accent, so I'm reading my reading. I get an accent. Are you Gustav the Angry Train? Is that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I always use it as a. Well, I'm a little hard of hearing for it, so you're going to be able. I think they are, but I don't. I don't. I think Dylan Jones are. Yeah, I think so. I think he's been annoying. He's annoying. He's annoying. He's annoying. Donna. We just did this, Jackie. There we go. We've got a couple of minutes. It's not 7.30 yet. So. This one? Well, that one's okay. I have the other handout from last week, right? Yes, and this new handout is helpful. I, I just made new handouts, Joyce, so that we're all having the same one. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, I see. But there's some from last Yeah. I, 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 we didn't get through last week. I knew we were going to have a couple of new people tonight, so I kept the first two pages the same. And then we'll. So these are the. Yes, thank you. All right, I will appear magically. We have decaf coffee on the go. We're all old enough that we just. Yeah, we're all, we're all at that age where decaf coffee is. <laughs> Is important to us. <laughs> What's wrong, Fritz? I'm just saying, you know, it's just saying. Just saying. One, one, two, three, twenty, but. Where it's done. Where it's done. Where He didn't know which book. Just pick no, one of 66. We'll start with any. We crashed a funeral once, accidentally. Be careful, we are money. That's a curious story without naming names. <laughs> Were there good sandwiches? or? Well, I, it was at one church in Medicine Hat. Across and we the Toyota, the Toyota yeah. and we're, he was getting an oil change. It was taking so long. And Chris was like, let's go check out that church. And I said, there's a lot of cars. And he said, it's a big church. It's a big staff. So I was like, okay, it was summer. I was in like tank top and shorts. shorts. So we go into the church and I was like, oh, like there's a lot of people here. And it was a choir. I said, oh, <laughs> how lovely. We didn't see the <laughs> And it was I a few. kind of pick up on the music was a little more so. <laughs> a little less so, so than. We couldn't than walk out anymore, right? So we, we, we just sit there. You stayed? We, well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
funniest thing was that we went to the dealership. It was there not the, I don't know what the medicine hand newspaper is called. It was his obituary. Oh. So we knew everything about him. So I said, let's go for the lunch. Yeah, because he was Because then I could say, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, he was a Poor Gustav, yeah. <laughs> Oh, I love it. Well, it is. It is. I don't know about your guys' stories. They're pretty funny. That's, that's a great story. All right. Uh, Joyce, you want to just pop out and see if anybody's here? And if not, we will start. Uh, oh, there's Donna. Hi, Donna. If you're joining us online tonight, uh, welcome. I trust you were able to download the PDF of the notes uh, so that you can partner with us or participate with us. And for those of you who are here, you all have a copy. We'll make sure that Donna gets a copy as well. We have a couple of new people here, and I knew that was not necessarily these new people, but another new people I was expecting. So I was expecting new people. So in light of that, uh, we are going to backpedal a little bit to last week to do a catch-up so that you feel you're a part of what's going on so you're not going where am I at in this whole equation we are studying the book of Romans and the first page you have in front of you and the first page you have in front of you oh before I go any farther um, this is meant to be interactive even though this feels a bit one-sided like I'm at a chair and you're 12 feet away um, that doesn't mean you can't either put your hand up or just blurt it out loud I leave it up to your personality type to determine uh, what you say and when you say it. If you want to cut me off halfway through the sentence, feel free to do that. If you want to be nice, just put your hand up. But um, So feel free at any point to ask questions, interject ideas, or, or and not even just ask questions, you go, oh, right, that reminds me of this, or this would be more information to help, or I don't agree with what you said. Because Dylan's looking for people to disagree with him. Oh, I'm ready for a fight. So he is. He's itching for a uh, There are copies there for you. So again, just because I'm monologuing here doesn't mean this is a monologue. And Ethan, do you want to grab, there's enough, because there's some new material in there as well, so grab yeah. one for everybody. Thanks, Dylan. Uh, Ethan. Ethan. Elan. All right, uh, that should give you time to grab a cup of coffee or a juice or soda or whatever you're after these days. And there is decaf coffee for everyone here because most of us are at the age when decaf is of a benefit. Yes, Joyce? You had your what? I did have my hand. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. She was just testing out to see if it actually worked. Is he actually paying attention when I put my hand up? So. All right, welcome to the book of Romans as we continue on. Here's a bit of a recap of the book. When you think of the book of Romans, what comes to mind? This is the participation part of the evening, which is hopefully will be many tonight. Romans 8. Which is? All things work together for good for those that love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. Yeah. Give me another second. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? What comes to mind with Romans? The Roman Empire, good. He's writing to the city in Rome and all the stuff that goes on there. We've talked to somewhat about the background, the cultural things, and especially uh, the, the moral perversion of the empire. Anybody else? When, what does Romans bring to mind? Salvation. Ah, good. This is the great doctrine of salvation. Exactly. So if I said Romans 3.23. Awesome. Great. Good. Romans 8.23. Good. Excellent. All right. Yeah, there's some pretty famous verses in here, right? Okay, so just a bit of an outline. Romans chapter 1, 1 to 320 is the whole basis of the need of, and I was reminded again this week, to be careful with the big words we use so that we don't confuse people. So what is, when we use the word justification, what do we mean? Made right. Made right. And the Sunday school answer for that is? Jesus. Yes. Just as if I've never sinned. Justification. So, just as if I've never said. So, why do we need Jesus? And what does Romans 1 through 3 tell us? We are terrible people. We're terrible people, right? <laughs> All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is none. Oh, man, you guys, good. This is your Sunday school teacher would be so proud of you. <laughs> good, none righteous. So, he begins with this argument. Why does he begin with that argument? Set the stage. 
to set the stage. So what, is, what are people thinking? If someone says this, what might they be addressing? Problem. A problem. And what's the problem? People can't, yeah. We can't serve, and we don't think we need help, right? We, we have this mindset that, and the, the world was the same way. We don't need, and particularly Romans, they didn't think they needed who? Yeah, or Jesus, right? Because they had all their gods, they had their blood of bulls. So he has to convince everybody, or, or show everyone, that not only are they in need, but they need Jesus. Very good. Seven times out of ten, the answer will be Jesus, good. As a friend of mine once said, if you can preach your sermon in a synagogue, you have failed miserably. <laughs> so, all right, that's it. And then 321 through 425 is the next part, and that is the means of getting right with Jesus. And what is the means? <laughs> good. <laughs> You're doing great. Yes, the cross, Jesus, right? He was delivered up because of our breaking of the law and was raised so that we might be made right with him. So that's her. All right. Then he picks up in 5 verses 1 through 11, which is, uh, sorry, 5, 1 to 21, which is the center section of this book, and that is the results of being made right with God through justification. And we looked last week or last, uh, last couple of times ago that it's past, present, and future. It affects our past, it affects our present, and it affects our future. And then in 12 through 21, he argues now or he presents now how justification came into being. This is the big section on the how it works. So, Dylan, what are the four strokes of a four-stroke engine? <laughs> I'm trying not to remember it that way. <laughs> Intake, compression, power, and exhaust. Exactly. We want to know how it works. Uh, whether it's uh, some of you work in the heart and the mind, how do people work? We're fascinated by how people think and their processes. So we want to scratch below the surface. Donna, how does bread rise? Exactly. That's the mechanical chemical reaction, right, versus puff pastry, which is mechanical. Exactly. So we, as a cook, you understand the mechanisms and thereby are able to produce the results you want. Whereas some people like me, we're hoping for the best. I once put four cloves of garlic into something because it called for four cloves of garlic. I put four bulbs of garlic in. So I, I don't understand the processes. So we know you're not a vampire. Yeah, or, or a good cook at all. So this is what Paul is doing. He's opening up, up, and he opens up this explanation by talking about two atoms, not A-T-M, two atoms. And he answers the question, how is it possible for God to save sinners in the person of Jesus Christ? Because that's what people are saying. Okay, you're saying Jesus saves us. You're saying we need to be saved. What's the mechanism? We understand that somehow Christ took our place on the cross, but how does this work? And that's the section we're delving into in this uh, last week and this week. And then the rest of the book is uh, six, chapters 6 through 8. The outcome, what that means in our lives, 9 through 11, is the relationship between Israel and this new justification. And then 12 through 16 is how this community of justified people now live together. Also, more increased it not, in addition to that, how they live together with the Romans. Because what were the Romans like? They were nasty people, right? Well, not nasty. They were, it was a violent culture. And so this doctrine that in Christ there is neither slave nor free, Greek nor Jew, male or female, how do you think that's going to fly in the life of a Roman? It's, it's abhorrent, right? Because Rome is built on slavery. Women have no property rights. Uh, they are the uh, chattel property of their father, and until they get handed over to their husband, they remain property. Uh, that's why we used to, we don't do so much anymore, uh, hand at the, who gives this woman to be married to this man? We're handing the property over to her new owner. You can see where that has fallen out of favor. But still a nice gesture. All right. So here's my assignment for tonight. Last week we talked all about the two atoms. Uh, the first atom and the second atom. And they are being, we saw that this section 12 through 21 is the center section of the book. So take this page for now and just set it aside because you're going to need it in a minute. You can rip your stuff apart. And then we're going to jump into this. So 15 through 19, the center section, is this contrast between two kingdoms, the kingdom of grace and the kingdom of death. That kingdom of death is going to become so paramount to the rest of the discussion tonight and the rest of the gospel of, of well, it is the gospel of Rome. It's a good book, good, the good news. 
So, in 521, uh, Joyce, do you want to read 521 for us? So that, just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Good. So what is the key word there in the middle of that sentence? What's the word that jumps out at you, or what words jump out at you? Grace. Grace. grace and... Righteousness. These, these eternal life. What's that? Oh, sorry. Eternal life. eternal life. And then the word reign. That's the big oh. verb, right? So he's talking about the reign of death and the reign of life. All right. Here's what I want you to do. Grab this sheet that you just saw there that you had aside and this piece of sheet, piece of sheet, piece of paper, this sheet of paper with the two columns. And what I'd like you to do is look through the text through 12 through 21 and write down all the words or ideas that are tied to the free gift, the gift of life, and all the words and ideas, adjectives, nouns, all those, whatever it is, images, pictures that fit under the other column, that is the reign of death. Make sense? So these are all the pictures, words, ideas, adjectives, adverbs, anything you can think of, or if you don't know what those words mean, pictures of that. So this one might be, I'll give you a freebie, Adam, I'm oh, sorry, Jesus is the free gift, Adam is the old, uh, that would be two ideas, right? Sin entered the world, death through sin, death, sorry, wrong column, death through a spread to all man, and that. Make sense? All right. Uh, take time. Joyce is going to sing for us <laughs> while you do that, because I like to provide a little background music. No, no, I didn't, she wasn't unexpected. <laughs> I don't want to, we won't spend too much time, but I, what I want you to see is the contrast that Paul's establishing because he, this is a photograph in black and white. It's stark contrast. Let's see how our Miller students do. Where are we taking this from? Uh, from Romans 5, 12 through 21. And the reason I gave you the text is so we all use the same language or words. Does that make sense, everybody? And because this is adult education, you can look on each other's papers. <laughs> feel free, by the way, feel free at your table to discuss it with each other. You don't have to do this on your own. This is adult education. So this is a group project. So Donna and Joyce, you can work together. Yeah, he uses marketplace language as well, doesn't he? Thank you. 
that's part of the negative of like a transgression. Yeah, 20 is tricky, isn't it? Oh, okay. Yeah. You're on 13. Okay. All right. Well, <laughs> well 20 is the law as well. Because 20 puts a positive spin on the law. So you know we're on page two of eight pages tonight, so uh, we, we'll give you another five minutes. Oh, yeah. yeah. I didn't come here to do homework. Make me work. Fritz, you're writing with your right hand. I always do. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was forced. No. Oh, right, right. That's my left one. Is still yes, right that makes sense. Fritz is a lefty who was trained to use his right in that generation. <laughs> Consider evil people or something, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. All right, give you a couple more minutes and then we'll uh, see what we what we've created. Are you left handed, Ethan? Yeah. No. <laughs> We're writing to see if we can read our own writing if we use our left hand. Can you? <laughs> I know that's my name. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of it looks like Egyptian hieroglyphs. You should also try to do that with a coil bound notebook because the coil is underneath your hand. Mm -hmm. No kidding. Okay. Well, yeah. But how are lefties neat writers then? Sorry? They're all neat writers. He's not. No, He's I'm not. not. Because they're very slow, maybe. But you write very much from like top down. That you, you have no, I push across and I go very fast because my brain's four words ahead of my what I'm writing. That's my problem. <laughs> I've already forgotten what I'm writing because I'm thinking something else. <laughs> All right. Okay, crew of great wisdom. Let's, uh, oh, I'm just going to start shouting them out, and if someone's already said it, just say, yep, I agree with that, or add to it. Let's start over here with Donna and Joyce. Fire off a few on the free gift side. There we are. Hang on, you're on camera. Say again. Under the law, sin that leads to death. Okay, that's the transgression side. Good. Donna? These are all wonderful things. Good. Yeah. Table B. What do you want? Gifts or transgression? Either or. You throw it out. Throw it what you got. Abundance of grace, obedience, righteousness, eternal life, death through sin, the law, condemnation, disobedience. Good. Anything else you guys want to add? It's all been said. Okay. Well, there. 
Johnny, Johnny. Justification of life to all men. Good. Justification of life to all men. By the way, when we use the word man, we don't mean gender, we mean humanity, right? Um, that's why we get like a manslaughter. It just doesn't mean men killing men. It means humans killing humans. So the, when scripture uses that word, it's speaking in the broadest sense of all living beings. Women can't read this and go, well, I don't have a problem. <laughs> it's all you men. You're the ones killing each other. You're the transgressors, you know. We are scot-free here. Uh, it, it's using it in the traditional English sense of the word uh, Human. Uh, that's why the word woman, if we go back to the, to the woo, woo part, the, it's not woe man or we man, it's actually with, it, and that just means female. And that word actually means female human. So, anyhow, it's not, uh, sorry, etymology. All right, so, wise table. Anything you want to add? Did he say judgment? I don't think so, so let's throw that in the mix. Anything else? Okay. Because the transgressions are all past tense. Yes. And the free gift is all future tense. So where's the present tense? He is talking, that's a very good question, Shelley, and I have to explore that. But if you grasp something uh, that Paul is making a very clear point about, that we have gone from the past transgression and we live in the future promise of forgiveness and grace and all these wonderful things. Mm -hmm. Which still leads us. Yes, and that's worth exploring, and I don't have an answer for you right now. It's very good. You get an extra sticker tonight. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a good observation. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. Educated people. Anything jump out at you as you look through those lists that we've generated together? And you as a person went, that's what I grabbed from there. Yeah, they're the opposites, right? It's a high contrast. Grace is grace the opposite of truth? The opposite of truth. Uh, sorry, great. No. Yeah, grace and truth. We discussed this last night at, at elders that we sometimes think grace and truth. One is generous and kind. One is harsh and cold. No, Scripture says grace and law are the opposites. Grace and truth are actually partners. It's grace and law that are the enemies of each other. So. You really had people like almost offended at you that you'd suggest they were opposite. Yeah, I know. It was like, oh, what are you talking about? <laughs> they weren't at elders meeting last night, obviously. Okay. <laughs> All right. This passage, and I wanted you to get your head around it and your heels into it, becomes the foundation of one of the core doctrines of the church. And this we move on to the questions that arise from it and the answers that have been given to it. So, if you turn the next page, here's a series of questions we want to address tonight. What exactly did we inherit from Adam? Well, what does the passage say? We inherited death, right? How are we affected by that? We die, right? So, does this passage simply mean that we have a tendency towards sin or a tendency towards death? As a consequence, um, excuse me, sorry, the tendency towards sin. Does it mean that we are sinners from birth? Does it mean that infants are guilty of sin? Because infants we know die. Are they guilty of sin? Is that why they die? Are we all born in sin and with sin? If so, how can we be held responsible for an act we didn't commit? After all, you and I had nothing to do with Adam and Eve's actions. How is that sin then transferred or passed down from generation to generation? Are we guilty of Adam's sin? And what is this sin nature? Any other questions arise in that realm of thinking from this passage that hopefully we can answer tonight? All right, this passage forces us to address the questions. What is the spiritual and eternal condition of infants and children? Are people basically bad, basically sinners? 
Are they good? Are they neutral? Are they some mix? Those of you who work in mental health and care, I mean, those are the issues that you address. Those of you who are employers and employees working, you know, uh, who am I working with? If I say to myself, every one of my employees is inherently bad, how am I going to treat them? What's that, Chuck? Not good. Not good, with very little trust. But if I also go downtown to Saskatoon and assume that everyone's good, <laughs> you may lose your wallet, right? Yeah, you're going to walk home, you're walking home. So we, we find ourselves, these aren't just theological questions. They're the day-to-day -day grind of life. So can I trust a person? Are they inherently good? Are they inherently bad? What about my children, my grandchildren, those around me? What are the consequences of being a descendant of Adam? And what are the two kingdoms? And, and then how do I get from one to the other? So those are some of the questions. And that's why we study theology. Because it affects how we treat people in downtown Saskatoon, how my boss treats me, how I think about my children. And what happens if my children, and I don't mean to say this facetiously, God forbid, would pass away. Um, we have experienced that. So that's why these passages. All right. The church has answered this question by calling it original sin. Anybody heard that phrase before? What does that phrase mean to you? Right, the sin that we de yeah, deal the with. Sin that we've inherited. inherited. Okay, that's one word. Deal with is another word. Born with. Sorry, Fritz? Born with. We are born with. Good. Any other words you want to throw in there? Experience, perhaps? All right. Early Christianity, if we go right back to the teachings post Paul, um, there were, actually was no specific doctrine of original sin. That phrase doesn't appear until the fourth century. So for 300 years after this was written, after Paul was written, the phrase original sin. So the phrase original sin is not found in the Bible. That is one of those extra biblical words. We have to accept that. The idea slowly developed in the writings of the early church fathers as the New Testament was composed and people started thinking about it. And the authors, there's a, there's a book called the Didache. And what it is, is it's a series of teachings about how the church should live in the second, third, fourth, and fifth centuries. For example, as today, should Christians be allowed to be actors? Any problems with that? No. no. But in the Didache, you weren't allowed to be. Should, the Christian, should Christians be in the military? Sure. Sure. In the Didache, they were not allowed to be. <laughs> if an out-of-town speaker comes and starts to talk to you, how many days do you feed him for? Three. Good. That's in the Didache. You yeah, you get a sticker, yes. <laughs> The Didache said, after three days, he must work. So there were all these instructions about how to live out, what they could do, how to get baptized. And it goes so far as to say that you had to get baptized in cold, running water. You know? So it's basically a policy manual for the first time. Well, the Didache doesn't include any mention or of the doctrine of original sin. Um, then there's another book called The Shepherd of Hermas, which is, again, a guidebook, uh, the Epistle of Barnabas, all these books that were written in the late 1st and 2nd century. And each of these authors, Didache, all these really assume that children are born without sin, that original sin does not affect children. So we know that the early church fathers uh, did not regard children as being born in sin. Okay, that's important. The Didache is that manual of how to live... Joyce was talking on your deaf side. There. Sorry, Joyce. That's okay. Just wondering what it was. It's a, it's a book, basically. Yeah. Uh, just a book of rules. Okay. Yes, post. Yeah. Just like the book of Hermie, the Shepherd's Guide. These are all books that were written by well-meaning Christians because the church said, how do we live life in the empire? And that's the book. Yeah. Then along came a guy named Clement of Rome, not the orange, uh, and a guy named Ignatius of Antioch. And they took universal sin for granted, but they never explained how it happened. So these early church fathers said, yeah, we recognize there's sin, but we're not going to go into any detail of how it happened. Then along came a guy named Justin Martyr. Who's got a nice loud voice? Dylan, you want to read that paragraph for us? Justin Martyr wrote. Justin Martyr wrote that the Christ has suffered to be crucified for the race of men who since Adam were fallen to the power of death and were in the error of the serpent. Each man committed evil by his own fault. Okay, I'm going to stop there. So what does Clement propose about original sin? Adam, Sorry, Justin, not Clement. Yes, since Adam were fallen to the power of death. So we're under the power of death, but 
Each person is culpable, responsible for their own sin. He says, we are fallen and we're in error of the serpent. Each of us commits evil by our own fault. He says, we are guilty, we will suffer death, but our guilt, we don't inherit guilt from Adam. We inherit death from Adam. But where do we get the guilt from? Ourselves. Because we sin. Okay? That will become very important because that's a huge distinction. Okay? Keep going, Dylan. Um, and men were created like God, free from pain and death, provided they obey the precepts, and were deemed worthy by him to be called his sons. And yet, like Adam and Eve, each one brought death upon himself. So Justin Martin is a very interesting thing. He says, we inherited death from Adam, but we each bring death upon ourselves. So he doesn't hold to a position that we are, that we possess a sin nature from Adam. He says, who has the sin nature? <laughs> we just do ourselves. So that will become important later on. And that will become very different. Along came the third century. So that was the doctrine of the church for the first 200 years. And if you grew up in church in the first and second centuries, that's what you heard. Then along came the third century. And a guy named Augustine of Hippo. Hippo was in North Africa. A uh, hippo just means river horse. Yeah. They saw these big things and said, that looks like a horse. It's in the river. It's a hippo, a river horse. I'm not sure which is the horse part, which is the river part. So that just or what kind of horses they were used to seeing. What's that, Donna? He was just like, from the area where hippos were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, so he's, and the town, the area was called Hippo. <coughs> so it's like being from Horseville. That's like <laughs> Donna from Horseville, Augustine of Hippo, not being born of a hippo. So Augustine then, he coined the phrase, and that's the first time we have it in history, a written history that we know of, the phrase original sin. And Augustine taught that unbaptized infants go to hell as a consequence of original sin. And that's where the doctrine of infants being guilty of original sin and being the need for being baptized. Mm -hmm. And it talks about how if one of you causes one of them to stumble. Exactly. And that kind of passage will bear weight on our understanding. Good. It's not what I have in my, book, in my way, notes. The way Jesus talks about it, if you want it, you need to be like them. Yes. Implying something about them. There's something about the children. Yeah. So would you argue, not argue, would you present the idea that Jesus does not teach original sin in children? Good, and we'll get to that. don't understand that. And I think once you do, now you're on the hook. Good. And, and that's where we get Justin Martyr and Augustine Hippo contradicting each other, having a very different opinion. So a friend of mine posted a picture of his uh, infant daughter being baptized and said, her name I say was Grace, Grace has dealt with original sin. So the idea of baptizing infants is that it purges them of original sin so that baptized babies go to heaven. And Augustine said that unbaptized babies who have not had original sin per or cleansed will go to hell. Well, it's interesting because I remember when I was still working, and this was years and years ago, a baby had died in the hospital and the baby hadn't been baptized yet. Yeah. But those parents insisted that baby be baptized after death. Yeah. So the baby had already died. Yes. And then they still... But they were, because of this doctrine, <clears throat> yeah. which was not taught until the 4th century. All right. You're, I hope I've got your, my hooks into you tonight. Good. By the 15th century, so from the 3rd century all through the Middle Ages, Augustine's doctrine held sway. And that's why we get this massive push for the sacraments, uh, for all these things, because they believed that their children who were not baptized were... And then somebody came along and said, well, no, that's not right. They go to a place called Limbus Infantum. They will know the glory of creation, but not the glory of the divine. Because this doctrine was so offensive to any parent. They modified the doctrine to say that all infants upon death, because back in the day of you know the 12th century, babies died. Uh, all, all dogs go to heaven. 
Yeah, and so children didn't get to go to heaven, heaven, but they went to limbus infantum. The uh, limbo for infants is what he's talking about. All right. Then along came the 15th century and the Protestant Reformation occurs. And Protestants like Martin Luther and John Calvin, they equated original sin, they changed its definition and they said, really what we're talking about is a tendency to sin. We're all born with a tendency towards it. Or a, what Calvin called the hurtful desire. We all have a desire within us to hurt someone else. But, kind of a, but if that's your mindset of people, everyone desires to hurt somebody else, you got a country song going there. I guess there. Like we're not given sin, but we're given the knowledge of good and evil. Ah, yes. So we're given. Good, good. Fruit gave, fruit didn't give sin. Right. Fruit, ah, good. And you're, you're way over here, Dylan, and I love that. Okay, we'll get there. I'm over here. Yeah, <laughs> you're up here. So Calvin presented the idea that original sin resulted in our complete inability to do anything but sin. So Calvin said, human beings are totally depraved. All they can do is sin. If you do something nice to your neighbor, that's still sin because you're just a selfish little person, right? Calvin completely obliterated any good in humanity and said, total depravity. This got to be such a point that people hated Calvin. When he was ruling over Geneva, their rules said, here's the only names you're allowed to name your children. And people got so mad, they started naming their pets John Calvin. <laughs> so they could yell at him, you know, Calvin, get out of this house. Calvin, get over here. And like he just, there was vitriol against him because Calvinism produces such a dark doctrine. The idea that God would elect some children to heaven and choose to elect some children to hell is a horrific doctrine. Needless to say, I'm not a Calvinist. <laughs> God has the right as the potter to make some vessels for honorable use. That's right. Dishonorable use, and I think yes. I'm not sure exactly what that means. But we can do we can do the cal as when we're actually you know what Dylan we're going to hit that right in Romans because that sounds very well. There you go. God makes some to go to yep. heaven. God makes some go to hell. It's yeah. You can read it that way. And that's where we get as we get later into Romans we'll see that he hardens Pharaoh's heart. And this whole idea of predestination, that's all going to come up. Because Romans is the book that Luther read that changed his mindset. So, yeah, we are going to, Dylan, not only are you over here, now you are like two weeks down the road. But excellent. Very good. Good. So original sin then seems to be this hereditary depravity and corruption that somehow we inherit our depravity and our corruption diffused into every all and every part of the soul that first makes us liable for God's wrath and then produces. That's what Calvin and Luther taught. So the question then became that the reformers started asking, so how do you get sin? How do you inherit sin? If sin is inherited, because there's nothing you can do about it anyways. And they came up with the idea of what's called the father line. And that is you inherit your sin from, from men. Men pass sin down the line. And Jesus was, right, but he did not have a father. Therefore, he did not inherit sin. And that became the argument, that sin is passed through the DNA of men. And women, therefore, are potentially sinless. But she had the fruit. <laughs> yes, yes, but sin comes through the line. <laughs> yes. I think the women came up with this idea. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's good. I appreciate that. Again, this is open discussion. You feel feel free to put Dylan down. I just <laughs> Yeah, I just I had to poke a little. All right. What's the problem with this idea that it's the father line? Yeah, that means sin is passed through your, your DNA. And you got no choice. And you got no choice. That's right. What do we do get, what do we get through our DNA? Quirks. Quirks. Certainly some personality traits come through our DNA. I'm, you know, I don't want to go too much in there. I think a lot of our, how we think, how we, a lot of it is passed through, down through our fathers, you know. Um, you have never met my dad, but trust me, you've met my dad, mm -hmm. you know, in many, many ways. For better or for worse. And you've also met my mother, which, <laughs> anyway, we'll leave it there. <laughs> All right, the second way they theorized was that sin nature, the nature to sin is actually not sin. 
Uh, the terms sin nature and original sin are not found in the Bible and are terms derived by humans. Sin nature is the tendency towards sin, not sin and of itself. This avoids Jesus. So I, I think Dylan's already said that sin nature is the, the inclination towards it, but not sin itself. So we're not sinners until we sin. Does that make sense? That's why babies are sinners. Ah, very good. All right. Thirdly, sin nature passes spiritually. Originally, sin is non-material and doesn't need to pass along via genetics. It's passed along spiritually by virtues. In other words, we, we inherit the, the death of Adam through a spiritual connection. That's the implication here. What are your thoughts on that? Or do we inherit death biologically? You know, it's interesting when you think about it. There's some things that small children don't have to be able to comprehend and understand through display. Which right. Which is strange. Right. right. You think about that. You say, well, no, we have a tendency towards it. but So you've inherited something, but you're able to act unholy or unrighteous before you're aware that you're even doing it. Right? Yes. Like, and that's called innocence. Innocence is not knowing the difference between good and evil. Which is really a curious thing. Like if Adam and Eve had been sinned, would their kids have just been perfect and never complained? Yes. No, or would they have done something wrong and not know it was wrong? Is, did Adam and Eve... It wasn't, it wasn't, you, you don't, you learn about the knowledge of it. That's right. Not the capacity and ability to do it. That's right. So, did Adam and Eve... What's that, did Ethan? You can choose things knowing that they're evil now. Right. But that suggests you could kill somebody and be like, oh, it's not a big deal or something. You know what I mean? like, and that's the implication weird. of that. What did Adam and Eve actually inherit? Did they commit deeds that were outside of judgment? They, they didn't know if they were good or evil. They just did them. And then later on they realized, oh, that's a good thing to do. Oh, I shouldn't do that. You're right. You know, did they kill somebody that, you know, whatever, Nakedness and have no knowledge? Nakedness wasn't a problem. That's right. Or like a child can punch something and not think it's a bad thing to do. They just reach out and they smack you. Now we pass judgment and say, don't do that. That's a bad thing. We give them knowledge of good and evil. But they, in of their own mind, don't know it's good or evil. They just do it. Is that fair to say? I so got my psychologist eyes spitting from, here. They learn from watching, watching people around them. Yeah. It's nature versus nurture, right? So Very good, Fritz. Yeah. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And that's the question. How much is nature and how much do we... Uh, yeah. You're familiar with tabula rosa, right? The idea that we're blank slates and we only learn as we go. Or how much is in our nature, our DNA, to do that? These are all the questions that we're addressing that scripture is actually trying to wrestle with. So, so kids, I mean, go ahead. Well, kids inadvertently do good things then too. That's right, I know it. Or are they actually originally good? That's a very good question. But you can see it comes from a place of warmth, but yet you can see a one-year-old, when they don't get their way or the other little kid takes it, they get angry and they hit. Yep. And they don't, I don't believe, like I've seen little kids and I go, well, I don't think your parents have shown you to hit each other when they don't get their way, so yeah. where does that come from? And does, or does the child even think that's a malicious act? The child's just acting instinctively. Or, or are we putting a lot on it because their brains aren't really developed? That's right. They have no knowledge of good and evil. Yeah. At mean, what age do we develop a conscience? We do say, you know, when uh, uh, kids are selfish as babies already because they scream, they want, which I don't think they actually are because no. they, they're hungry. Yeah, yeah, we're we're, we're, apl yeah. we're applying a moral value to that act when there is no moral value. Yeah, and that's the same with protecting or hitting, right? Like yeah. defending themselves is that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, there's defense, but there's also just anger. Like you see a kid, yeah. they don't. Somebody yeah. else takes the thing, and maybe it is feels possession or something like that. But yeah. But it, yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, and are they doing? And again, I think we give children knowledge of good and evil. We're saying to them, that's a good thing to do, or that's, you know, did you teach your kids to lie? No. no I certainly didn't teach ours. Uh, well, maybe I modeled it for them. <laughs> but they do instinctively, right? Um, but in their minds, is that a bad thing? But I find it very interesting, though, like just uh, what you're teaching here, how, how through the centuries, we developed, we basically, humans, yes. made that judgment of what is doing what is bad. That's right. And that all rooted in the knowledge of good and evil. And that knowledge has grown over time. We have increased in knowledge of what is good and evil. And we have redefined good and evil as well. So we say now that there are some things that are amoral, not im, like a, without moral value. We say, you know, some things aren't good or evil, they just are. And some things are inherently 
Is anything inherently evil? Is there an act that is pure evil? Yes, I think there are. Yeah. Anything that harms children, I would put in the category of inherently evil. Because Jesus said, if you hurt a kid, it is better off for you to be dead, I tell you. Dead. You don't put a billstone around your neck. So I think there are things that are. Yeah. Any other thoughts before we proceed? Okay. So this idea that uh, this third one is it's passed on spiritually by virtue of all descendants of Adam, but God withheld original sin from entering Christ in the womb. So if sin is passed through spiritually, God actually stopped the spirit of, of sin and death from entering into Christ at his conception. That's right. You can see the whole idea was, ah, this is male genetics. That's right, yeah. And that's, that's kind of a neat observation. I don't think it's not right, I don't think, but, yeah. but it's a neat observation. Because, well, and here is the problem with the father line. All right, some thoughts to guide us. First off, there are no scriptures that connect the virgin birth to sin, right? All it says that Jesus was born of a virgin and he was born without sin. And later on it says he became sin for us who knew no sin. What does that imply about him if he became sin? He had done before. He had done before, right. I can become whatever. That implies that I'm not that right now. So we know Jesus didn't have sin because he became sin. He wasn't sin. All right. Um, if sin nature comes through physical birth and passed through the father while reproduction occurs, in theory, I love this, is like right up uh, my alley, of sorts of ways, using two sets of female DNA, resulting only in a female, they would be sinless. <laughs> if sin is indeed passed through male DNA, you could take, you could clone two female DNAs, blend them together, create a woman, and she would be sinless. Would she be sinless? She had a father. She, yeah, but she doesn't have a father, right? Because she's cloned from two mother, female... But her mother's had a father. <laughs> right, but we bypass a generation. So, because it doesn't, you know, the inheritance... You, know, you can see where we're dancing with the edge of the pin now, yeah. right? But that's the problem with sin being inherited biologically. Yeah. It just, it, it, it bypasses, and it makes women inherently pure, right? Sinless. And then we start to get then the doctrine through the Middle Ages of the purity of women. Pretty and the... <laughs> yeah. and, and in the Middle Ages, men are held up as these carnal things, right? And women are <laughs> to affirm your identity <laughs> as, a, as a pure woman. Um, yeah, and so we create this, this Madonna effect in women, where women are seen as pure, you know, pristine, and men are the base corrupt. You know, and that's all born out of this doctrine of. Male genetic sin. All right. Secondly, what culture was that ever in? Oh, very Middle Ages Europe. You think of those. Well, the uh, the art of chivalry, right? That women are to be revered and held in high esteem. No, they weren't. It's a weird contrast when you think about it, right? Because oh, yeah. I, I see both of them. Like yeah, but yeah, you, they but did. You can see, like you say, chivalry. Yet you see, well, that doesn't really make sense. But there's. When you read the literature, women are held up in this high esteem. But they didn't think they had brains. No, no, that's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or what? We're much yeah, more than chat. Yeah, because we weren't smart enough to sit. That's right. That's oh, what I'm gonna fight you, Dylan. He said, "No brain, not me." I, I burned my bra when I was twelve. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am not entering this conversation. <laughs> It's matriarchal. It's, yeah, it's just not as common, but they do right. exist. Yeah, it does exist. Like there's some in Africa, I think. Right? Yeah. I yeah. There's some tribes over there that are very matriarchal. And, and then I you don't get. Know if they develop probably outside of the construct of scripture. Right, yeah. Yeah, and they're, they're operating different. on a very different basis. Yeah. The, 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 this idea, though, that women are somehow uh, more spiritual, uh, purer than men. Men are carnal and base, and women are somehow, we often think of spirituality being associated with uh, the goddess of earth, Diana, all these images of the purity and the spiritual nature of women. It, it's, it's there maybe in the literature, but you're right, Shelby, it's not there in practice. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, without sounding crude, it's called the horror Madonna complex. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that we, we tend to treat women either as you know, the, the perfect saint or as the, the whatever, right? And that's, that's the dilemma of that. Um, all right. Any, anything you, anybody else want it, Donna? I just have a thought of looking at it a different way because um, you have God working everything together for good. And so if 
he knows that man and his stupidity is going to think about this in the fourth century. So how do I cut it off? Well, when Jesus is conceived, there's no father in line. Yes. So, yeah. <laughs> let's he, stamp that out immediately. Yeah. Because they're going to screw it up four centuries from now. Yeah. Yeah. He puts in place the truth. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what do we do as humans? We messed it up, exactly. We subvert the truth because all of a sudden human reasoning went, hmm, and, and, and we lost the spiritual thing. And we're going to return back to Scripture when we're done this and say, what does Scripture actually say? We'll have to get through this man-made stuff. I mean, yeah, well, like these funky doctrines come from, from guys understanding your thoughts of it, right? And I think that comes from, I think guys are rigged to be very practical and reasonable and I'm, rational and say yeah. there must be an explanation. That's right. We're looking that for we can find and explain. We're looking for metho uh, methodologies. Right, so I think that's just kind of inherent to, to men that yeah. you want to explain. A and a mechanistic view of the universe. Right. But, uh, we can solve problems mechanically, do philosophy, we can yeah. do A, B, C, therefore D. Yeah. Right? And there is some of that, that's very Greek, by the way, right. um, versus a more mystical approach, which will... We're, oh, we got 10 minutes. All right, we're not going to get through all this tonight. <laughs> Secondly, you can sin without a sin nature. Did Adam and Eve have a sin nature? No, and yet they sin. So you don't need to inherit anything from Adam. Therefore, you don't need a sin nature to sin. Sin is something separate from the sin nature. That is a very interesting yes, that is, that's yes, that sets the balance in, right? We know that from Adam we inherited death, but Adam sinned prior to having a sin nature. Make sense? And, and that speaks for infants again. Yes. Because they don't. Exactly. And you can be tempted and have a tendency towards sin, Adam and Eve. And you can have a sin nature and not sin. Right? So because we know people who do good, who are kind, generous, forgiving, you know, they have inherited this from Adam, and yet they and we're gonna get into this too as we go on through later on. This whole idea that you can be righteous and righteousness. We'll see all these verses where Noah was declared righteous, David's declared righteous. Uh, and we'll see these in scripture where you can be a righteous person with a sin nature without being born again. So we get the fact that you can sin without a sin nature and you can be righteous with a sin nature. Does that make sense? Am I connecting the dots for everybody? Fritz? Okay, good. I just didn't know the brow was up or down. I wasn't sure. Good. I just want to make sure this makes sense. I got to read the room. All right. Third. Scripture says these are the consequences of the fall. We have to separate what all these people said and just look at Scripture. Genesis 3.17 says what? Somebody want to read Genesis 3.17? This is the one con the consequence we can be absolutely, regardless of what we think about sin nature or infants. Here's the one thing we know for sure. Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and Maybe you shouldn't read this passage, Joe. <laughs> He's going to fight me again. Go ahead. You say you shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. So, verse 17, keep going. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, and for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So what do we know is... The definitive consequences of Adam's and Eve's sin. The ground is cursed. The curse of the ground. You'll, and, and it'll be work to get your food. Yeah, labor. Unfruitful labor, by the way. With weeds. Yeah. Opposition. You're going to sweat. You're going to sweat. Life is going to be miserable. And then you'll die. And then you'll die. <laughs> Does it speak anything about sin nature? Our inclination to sin? No. All we know for certain is that what we inherited from Adam is a miserable life. Weeds, accursed ground, and death. That I can tell you for sure. What did you get from Adam? You got kosher, 30 degree days, and the grave. Then later on he's going to talk about the tension between men and women. Your desire will be for your husband. Your husband will rule over you. We're going to see tension between men and women, but nothing about sin nature. So for sure, we know that we got from Adam was a raw deal. Do you have to inherit that? No. All you have to do is just live in this world. And we know that all creation is cursed because of Adam and Eve. Right? Interesting, because of Adam. <laughs> Eve gets a pass <laughs> on this one. All right, that's what we know. But he was responsible because he was there. That's right, and, and he had headship. Yeah. Yeah. 
So there is no mention of any idea of original sin in the account of fall as we told in the Bible. Genesis records many consequences of the first transgression. Pain in childbirth, we didn't read those passages, but women have. So prior to the fall, what was birth like? A breeze. A breeze. Yeah, it was painless. <laughs> You're a woman of faith, but that's when you have a hard time coming to terms with Shelley. <laughs> okay, here's the question. We don't know how long Adam and Eve were in the garden. Some people think like four days. It could be a long time because death hadn't entered in. All right, so they could be there. Dance with me for a minute. They could be there, let's say, for 100 years. They were perfect. They were naked. They were given the command to be fruitful and multiply. And there was no pain in childbirth. How many kids were there? There could have been one every nine months. There could have been generation after generation after generation. Interesting. Yeah. Depends how long they were in the garden for. Because they were commanded to. There, were no, there was no suffering. Um, they were perfect people. And there was plenty of food and eat. You know, populations grow. <coughs> I, I wondered about that, Watts, obviously. But um, there's got to be somebody always that's done the math on it to say, well, you know, if you have a kid every nine months. Right. And those kids mature and have kids every nine months. And how many people do you have? And right. how fast do you spread out? Because by the time Noah's around, the whole earth is evil. Which and populated. the whole earth. But, yep. you know, you look at all that and go, well, how is it possible to have that many people? And then they're all gone. Yep. And then again, we get, how is it going to be that many people? And who did Cain marry? Exactly. He didn't marry a sister. Sisters. He might not have married, yeah. Well, he probably possible. could have married some girl from four continents over. Depends how long they were in the garden for. I, and, okay, we are way off the, off the Bible here, but this is, I think all these ancient civilizations, all this stuff are all pre-fall, that these civilizations existed. And that Adam and Eve fell, but there was an entire planet of people that fell around them. Or isn't the other theory that there's a whole bunch of the lost tribes, and that's where... Or hollow earth, depends on where you want to go with this. I'm good with that, whatever. All right, now we're speculating with the, on the angels, with how many angels they had of a pen. But it does change the picture, right? Because we see these things that are clear. No pain in childbirth, go forth, be fruitful, and multiply. Plenty of food, water, unlimited supply of, you know, populations are limited by food supply. We know that. Uh, so they had an unlimited food supply. Therefore, they can have an unlimited population. Anyhow, I'll let you speculate with that. All right, let's back to the text. Um, there is pain in childbirth, the ground is cursed, and the body dies but nothing at all about inher children inheriting Adam's guilt. So all we can go by is what we have in scripture. And all we know is pain and childbirth, destruction of male and female relationships, the, the, the opposition. Um, someone said the war between the sexes will never be over because there's too much fraternizing with the enemy. But uh, you could put up bump that if you want. Uh, so that's what we know. All right, fourth. Scripture speaks of sin as personal responsibility and action. It never speaks of a sin Guilty. Everyone who practices sin is lawless. Is is lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. It is not a condition of the heart. It is an action that has a consequence. Okay. Uh, nowhere in the preceding chapters in Romans does Paul speak about inherited guilt. The only guilt is why are we guilty? There is none righteous, no, not one. What's the rest of the verse? All sin falls short of the glory of God. Just go back to it. There's none righteous, no, not one. There is none that seeks after God. Right. Right? We're guilty, why? Because we don't seek after God. So there's something in our nature that doesn't want to seek God. And we start to get these little buds pop up the ground that tell us what we're like. What, what don't they tell us? How we got there. Why we're like that. It just says, we are. No one seeks God. And we go, yep. All right, making sense? Okay, we got a couple more minutes. Fourth. Scripture speaks of sin as per, oh, sorry, already, personal responsibility and action. Fifth, something else besides our body is dead even before our body dies. Here's where it's interesting. We know that we inherited death from Adam, the biological death. But something else in us is dead. All right, let's take a look at a few verses. Donna, do you want to read Ephesians 2, 1, and 5? They're there in the text. Um, and I, I put the spaces in if you want to read the whole, but these are the two pertinent verses. Please do. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Uh, five, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. Shelley, what tense is that? Past tense. Past tense. So prior to coming to Christ, we were what? 
We were dead. There's something in us that's dead, right? Even though we will biologically die at some point, prior to that death, there's something living dead, or dead living, you could say, well, look at it, inside of us. And so again, we get another little sprout that pops up and says, huh, people are held responsible for their actions, but there's something inside us that's dead. All right, let's keep reading. Uh, Fritz, do you want to read 1 Timothy 5, 6? But the, way, the, the window. The window. So the window of pleasure is dead, even while she lives. This is the zombie verse. Because she is dead while she lives, right? So she's alive and she's dead at the same time. So there's something in us that even though we're biologically alive, is dead within us. All right, John 3.3, 3, uh, Harlan. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Which implies that <laughs> if you're born again, you've got to die, right? I am crucified with Christ. You know, there's a point of death. So you have to be born again, which means there's something dead. So there's something else dead inside us besides the biological death. Now, did we inherit that? Did that death occur because we committed an act? Is that what death? You get what I'm kind of going at? There's something going on here under the text um, that says that people are dead inside. Is, and what's dead? Is it our ability to do good? Is it our ability to choose good? Is it our ability to desire good? So what do you think? What is dead inside us? I'm going to leave it here because we're going to, it's already uh, 830. That's interesting because the original, like in the beginning, it didn't really have to do with us. It had to do with what you gained by doing that. You gained the knowledge of good and evil. And we know that Adam and Eve were not dead <clears throat> biologically or spiritually prior to the fall. Which is weird, eh? Because they chose to sin. They yielded to temptation. How's your head tonight? Spinning a little bit? <laughs> Good. All right, we're going to pick this up next week as we then move to scriptural pieces that will help us turn these little stubs into healthy plants. And I hope when we're done, my goal is that you will have a clear doctrine in your head of what sin is, what nature is, and responsibilities, and certainly uh, about children, because I think we need that assurance. All right, any questions, thoughts, or comments as we wrap it up? I think the big thing that like, talks about, um, or the thing that I'm thinking anyways, is when uh, the widow who lives for pleasure is dead, you're dead in your transgressions and sins, um, like all these things, I mean, you're talking to people in a certain category. You're not yes. talking to children. No, you're this is, and that's the other part. By what you're reading, right? Yeah. The context of all these conversations is directed to adults. And we're going to get what Jesus talks about children a little later on. Um, and in particular, there's a passage in, in the Psalms that we have to address. Because there's one Psalm that seems at a surface reading implies that children are born in sin. But I'll be honest, I don't believe that's the correct interpretation of that passage. But there is that one that gets thrown on the table. Oh, yeah, but what about? And I go, yeah, well, here's an answer for you. Doesn't it make you look at salvation as a whole, though? Because this is all dead while you're alive. Yes. So we often think of salvation as the eternal life. Right. But actually, the message is more you're saved from the hell on earth. Yes, exactly. And if original sin isn't a thing, right? Right. Then what are you being saved from? If you are inherently good, yes. you're dead. Good, you're asking the right questions now, Shelley. Mm -hmm. Excellent. <laughs> and that's why, <laughs> earlier on, that's why the, the foundation... Yeah. Yeah. That's why the foundation earlier on, Shelley, Paul says, salvation is past, present, and future. He says, you are saved in the past, you are saved in the present, and you will be saved in the future. He wants us to know that sin has an effect in the past, Adam. It affects us in the present, the death within us, and it affects us in the future, the death to come. And as death reigns, past, present, and future, so too salvation reigns, past, present, and future. He's going to pull these dimensional ideas, just as he did the reign of death and Adam and, and death, so too he will pull salvation, our own necess necessity for salvation, past, present, and future, with salvation, past, present, and future. Yeah, this is a three-dimensional doctrine. But, but it yes. seems to suggest we need a savior because we are separated from him through sin. Right, right now. Yes, this and current death children, we're experiencing. Children are not separated from God.
God by sin because they have not sinned, then children are not in need of a Savior. Is that a weird thought? Yes, one worth wrestling with. Yes, and that's all the questions that stem out of this. But Jesus died for all. That's right. Now I have to do homework. <laughs> now you have to do homework, yes. Because I think this is a topic that's very easy to put our desires into. Right? Yes. Because what kind of a sick person would want an unborn baby to go to hell? So I think even still, hate to be the bearer of the possibility of something negative. We yes. We still have to take our truth. And we're going to get there, Ethan, because we're going to get to Corinthians where we talk about covenant. Yeah. Where, and I'm getting ahead of myself, where family covenant comes into play. And a child's spiritual protection is under the governance of his parents or her parents. In particular, da, 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 her mother. That the mother's spiritual nature has a direct effect on the child's spiritual nature. Yes, yeah, yeah, no, we're going to get there. Yeah, and the fact is, you know, we get to the point of, of uh, within Judaism, where we're going, that covenant, right, comes into play, and everything's about covenant, and a family covenant overrides the children, and they're protected by that covenant until they reach an age where they can become a son or daughter of the covenant, right? That's uh, 13, when you have your bar mitzvah or your beth mitzvah. You then take on the responsibilities of your own covenant with God, but up until that point, you are under the covenant of your parents. Ah, my crazy thoughts out the window then. Yeah, and that's why um, children, there's a whole biological thing too. Like at about age 12 or 13, we start to think of abstract thought. We teach fractions. We use, imagination comes into play. Uh, Piaget talks about moving from concrete operational stages to these more abstract thoughts. Um, and so that all reflects on this what happens to us at about 12 or 13 during adolescence, where we move into, we decide for ourselves what covenant we want. But aren't people saved when they're like Sorry? There's kids that are saved when they're really young. Absolutely. And they enter into a covenant themselves, but they're still under the banner, right? But they, they're at a point where they can then enter into their covenant with God. We talked about this last night at Elders about yeah. baptizing children. Well, where you can, I mean, at five, you understand as much as you can understand it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's right. You can enter into the... Value, but do you understand what it means for Jesus to the cross? And that's why Paul says each person is responsible for the, their understanding of the covenant. Yes. And he goes back to general revelation was the covenant. The rainbow is the covenant. I will no longer curse the earth, right? That's general revelation. And so, the, so those who don't have Jesus are responsible for their understanding of the covenant. And I think, too, children are un responsible for their understanding of the covenant. So should we not teach children the gospel so they can remain innocent? No, no, I'm just, now I'm being devil. <laughs> <laughs> What's that, Charlie? Your brain's not really fully formed until you're 25. Maybe we've got that far too low. Maybe it's too low. Maybe, yeah. yeah. I mean, maybe that's just because they work in a middle year school. And yeah. They're yeah. not smart people. That, yeah, they are, yeah. How many 13-year-olds would you trust to sign a contract? Very few. There would be the odd one. That's right, yeah. Yeah, you know, and what we should get is actually a representative of Child Evangelism Fellowship in the room uh, to talk about their theology of children. Yeah. But do you think that has anything to do, like, you think about how people used to get married in their mid, late teens? Well, yeah. And it seems, in my perception, that people were much more responsible and in tune with the world and what it meant to grow up and to do all these things versus 16 year olds now can barely tie the shoes. Yes, and that's part of the cultural is that, framework. Is that a falling short of the parents? Yeah. Is it the culture in whole? Is it? I, I would encourage you to read Neil Postman's book, The Disappearance of Childhood. He addresses those very questions. Yeah, about the development of adolescence and, you know, when the, the word teenager appeared in Reader's Digest for the first time in the 1950s, <laughs> is the first time it's used in culture, um, and the development of teenagers. Postman makes a very clear point that there used to be the enfeebled and the working. Children are the enfeebled, old people are the enfeebled, everybody else is in the middle, right? We sent kids to the textile mills. Um, and then we started to develop the concepts of adolescence and how long that was, and now we've extended that concept of adolescence well into the 30s. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and there's a cultural shift there as well. You know, definitely not arguing that we should move the marrying age down or anything. No, 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 I appreciate that. Just kind yeah. of observation, thinking about, you know, my grandparents even and how things were for them and Well, and that's because they died so young. You better start having kids at 15, because you're only going to be dead by 40. You know. There were some people that lived to be 100 years old. 
there were some, absolutely, yeah, yeah. When, when Otto von Bismarck set the date of retirement at 65 and the government payouts at 65, he chose that number because no one lived that long. <laughs> he said, the government will pay you after 65. <laughs> You're never going to live that long. <laughs> Yeah, that'd be like, yeah, 95. Retirement's at 95. We'll pay you after 95. So 10 of you will get retirement. Yeah, that's, that's almost what Bismarck did, yeah. So you are all pulling in the little threads of culture, history, theology, experience, uh, desire, as Ethan pointed out. We want the best all into uh, us very important questions. What is our nature? But it's surprising how much that sin nature, the original sin that we think about is not in there and how much, you know, we definitely, or myself anyways, yeah. you know, I have believed certain things that aren't in the text. Yeah, and my goal for us is to look at Scripture and say, we need to differentiate between what we've imposed on the text through culture, background, tradition, desire, versus what does Scripture simply say? And so, you know, tonight the one piece I want you to walk is, Scripture simply says that sin, the consequence of that, regardless of all these thoughts of original sin, really is about how we live this life, thorns and thistles, um, what happened? The fall. And what will happen? We will die. Past, present, and future. Tense. Boy, that's good, Sean. All right. Thank you.